Hello, hello. My name is Kiana Saxon, and I am here with Kaylee Warren. And it might seem like random to you, but I was literally searching on Google, and I'm I'm always trying to look up the latest articles and and trying to find any information about my topic, my topic that I'm very passionate about, as you know, which is representation for children and black representation in particular. I am, I think it's because of my personal experience uh, with my daughter trying to find children's content where she is in the center and not silly, off to the side, stereotype, sassy. And one of the articles that I came across, across very recently was um, this article entitled Black Children as Told to Them by the TV Screen. And it was written by Kaylee Warren. Kaylee, welcome. Thank you for having me, Kiana. So glad to be here. Yes, I'm always glad to have you um, and, and people who are just as passionate about representation. Um, and it, I, we, we talked a little bit before I pressed the record button. And I was like, oh, I really want to capture this on, on screen because you were, you know, being brilliant as you were in your article. Um, can you just give me a summary of the things that you talked about before? So um, just uh, give a chance to, to the people who did not read it. Sure. So uh, the article I wrote was about this question I had about you know, how children's self-esteem and their personal development is influenced by the media that they watch, particularly TV shows. And um, I just reflected on my own personal experience growing up and reflecting on how a lot of, you know, concerns that I presently had at the time were connected to media that I was consuming growing up. So for this paper, I looked at TV shows uh, that feature Black children as sidekick characters, and then TV shows that feature Black children as the main character, and just analyzed how those children and those characters function in the plot and how their characters are developed. And then looking at those differences and what they might say about how um, they're developing and sort of connotations that are attributed to their character and their personality with their peers in the world around them based on how um, they're treated in the, in the TV shows. And the findings were unsurprising, um, unfortunately, but they certainly illuminated how, you know, how Black children's development and self-esteem certainly has accord with how they're either put on a pedestal or completely taken off of it in the shows that black children watch. Exactly, and that's, and that's where, um, where it becomes particularly important um, that we analyze and really study. And it is that self-esteem um, piece, right, that you just said. And we, we understand that um, visuals and, and, and surroundings and um, role models, that they have an impact on children but yet, um, in the children's media space, we we are somehow cavalier, I think, and and I mean we in the broadest sense. I'm talking like the you know our human population. There's we're we're not really paying as much atten attention as we should um, to the children's media space. And I think that you know there's there are certain channels that are making great strides. We have PBS Kids, and they they try to make really content rich um, content. But then, you know, you have others that where the message, if you really boil it down and extrapolate it, you're, you're like, wait a minute. So I'm just supposed to follow after a prince, even though he really didn't do anything but smile <laughs> you know, or something, you know, like you know, the, the messages that we're really sending to kids is it's actually really not all that healthy. Mm -hmm. I think comedians have made a lot of fun um, of it, but to me, it's actually kind of serious. Um, so in the, in, when we talk about what are the messages that we are passing to Black children, what are some of these messages? Yeah, uh, I think some of the messages um, in, in the negative sense, which unfortunately is often the predominant sense, is that um, 
they're insignificant, that they're troublemakers, that, um, yeah, that, that they lack virtue, that they lack, um, that they lack a sense of, you know, having a, a right to self-preservation as well. And yeah, that, yeah, that I think that they're troublemakers who don't have any inherent sense of worth or good value, or that they can contribute in a positive, beneficial light to a situation is one message that really sticks out a lot for me at least. You know? Right. And what are some of the examples of, of shows? Not to like drag shows in the mud, but yeah, yeah. In a certain sense, I think that we, you know, I think writers really need to hear some very pop, some very like strong feedback in order to be able to change. So what are some of the shows that you um, analyzed and studied? Yeah, and, and even with that too, I think, because a lot of the shows, I mean, I grew up watching shows produced in the 90s and the early thousands. And so at the time writers, the conversation about race and representation was so different. And so there's likely this unconscious bias, unconscious or conscious, who knows, that, prop, that props up. Um, but the shows I, I looked at in the paper um, featuring black children as sidekick characters were uh, The Rugrats and um, Little Bill. And with the Rugrats in particular, you have one of the, really, she is a main character, Susie Carmichael, uh, who's treated like a sidekick character in the sense that Susie, you know, she's a new girl to the neighborhood. Um, and right off the bat, she's quite opinionated. You know, she's, you know, she's outspoken and she somehow possesses this toughness and, ultra strength for a toddler, which already is strange. <laughs> um, and she's put in this uh, situation with the other toddlers who are all white um, toddlers where they need help and she saves the day. You know, she pretty much like, I got it, you know, don't worry. Um, and so she helps them, but then whenever she starts crying later on in the show, when, you know, she's hurt by something, then she's labeled as a brat. Then she's labeled as being, you know, having an attitude and needing to just be quiet. And so here you have this character, Susie, who somehow is already a black woman, <laughs> you know, who mm -hmm. has to take care of, you know, these white children who can't help themselves, does so out of her own volition, like wanting to be, you know, a generous, kind person, but then we see, even with her own parents, how she's not seen as a child. You know, she doesn't get to cry and not even just get sympathy, but just get a sense of care, you know, and have her emotions be validated whenever she's hurt by something, whenever she needs help. And so a dynamic like that already plants the seed for a story that this young black toddler, this young black girl tells herself that her needs don't matter. Mm -hmm. um, that she's not deserving of care and just already planting that seed that she's a caregiver. She has to give, she has to be strong. She has to know how to self-regulate from day one, <laughs> you know, yeah. which is a valuable skill, but you know, you need to also learn how to receive. Um, so yeah, that I, I really looked at Susie, her character and how on one hand she was, she gave selflessly and was, you know, appreciated for it, but she doesn't have that equal give and take in her life because not even the children, the other white toddlers ever came in to help her out whenever she needed it. And then with the other show I looked at in the paper, which was before the, uh, the time of, you know, a lot of things, more contemporary things came about with the producer or creator of the show was Little Bill, um, which looks at how, um, well, no, that's Little Bill is a show where Little Bill is the main character. So the other show I looked at where there was a sidekick character was Hey Arnold. Mm -hmm. um, so they're a little bit older. They're about like middle school age. And Arnold has a best friend who's black. And um, he, the episode I looked at was how they're getting ready for the school play. And his best friend who I'll need to double check his name, 
but his best friend, um, they're getting ready for the play, they're running late, they've had some complications, um, but it's Arnold who's painted as the one who, you know, does everything he needs to do in order to get to the play on time and to help out their other friend who is a white woman have a successful play. They run into trouble on the way. And the fact that his friend who's black wants to just, you know, go ahead and get on about their journey and not stop to help people who otherwise hold them back. He's then painted as someone who isn't kind, who isn't helpful, you know, who doesn't care about the needs of others, you know, and it's just quite selfish. And like, he's just not, yeah, not a very thoughtful person. Yeah, yeah. So um, that, so it's like on one hand, you have a character who doesn't get their needs or is not seen as someone who can be worthy of an emotional experience. And then you have a character who, is trying to do the right thing by getting to a play on time for their friend's sake, but somehow is still painted as a bad character because, you know, he doesn't stop to help, in this case, another white person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like, which one is it? You know, how do you, all these things that you're expected to do, um, but then whenever you choose yourself or even think to do so, you're vilified for it still. Yeah. And the character's name, by the way, is Gerald, um, Arnold's best friend in the show. And so, you know, Gerald is, is like, he is like a rock in a hard place. He can't do anything right without still being seen right. as a wrongdoer. And so that would create a story in his mind that it doesn't matter what he does. He's always gonna be, be seen as someone bad. Mm -hmm. So why not be bad, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, just in a similar way, sort of not seen as someone who has a capacity for soft actions, since even whenever he does demonstrate some sense of care and integrity, it's still seen as something hard and rude, yeah. and selfish. So you know, for um, for women, for black women, we've we've had the the tropes of Jezebel, Mammy, um, and Sapphire, like, was it Sapphire or something? I, I forget, I yeah. forget what the, 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 all the terms, but and I, it kind of reminds me um, of the, what you were talking about before um, with Susie Carmichael that, you know, she is like this, you know, the mammy, like she really has to be this, this caregiver, but yet has to sound like a just, <laughs> it's weird in her, in her brashness. So, um, you know, these tropes start early is, is I think is, has been my like, you know, clarion call, like, you know, these things are starting too early. Um, the stereos, the stereotypes are embedded. And when you, when you, when you do the, the research, I mean, 80% of the directors in for children's media, they're men and they're, 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 no, they're white. And I think my, um, it, the data didn't give how many men there are, but there are very few women overall. So we had, had to, I would only deduct that it's mostly white men that are, that are producing and directing these shows. So, um, you know, there's, there's kind of no surprise that there's going to be that, that bias, that embedded bias. Um, I will say that Fast forward to um, Eureka on the for Disney Junior on Disney Junior. There, um, my daughter and I were watching um, one of the shows, one of the episodes, and there was this. They had gone away to some kind of state um, sleepover, and Eureka, as the the black main um, character, she's a she's she's a fixer too. I mean, she's a um, what are they? She's a thinker. Think. I I forget what what phrase that they coin, um, but she likes to think and she likes to tinker. So there's a they kind of combine those words, and um, so she was trying to solve everyone's homesickness. Mm. You know, um, one person they they uh, didn't 
they forgot they were stuffy. Another person wanted some pillows and the other person wanted to like have a story at the end of the night. And so she was solving everyone's problem. And so I had this, you know, internal groan um, when I was watching this, because I was like, oh, here we go again with this trope of like the black woman fixing everything for everyone. And to my surprise at the end of the show, and this is, I think, I think the show is written by a white, white woman, but at the end of the show, um, Eureka feels homesick. So similar to how Susie Carmichael then when she cries, she was feeling homesick. And it, I, my heart was just warmed when her friends turned around and said, well, what can we do for you? Mm-hmm. And here I, I'm, like, I'm sitting next to my six-year-old and like, <laughs> because like, we, well, like legitimately, we don't see that. Mm-hmm. We don't see how friends, especially non-Black friends, are going to take care of a Black girl of a black woman Mm -hmm. you know so it happens in the adult space too it's like we really just don't see it enough Mm -hmm. and yet uh, you know when we take it to the political world you know black women are are painted as these welfare queens you know like especially when um when the rugrats was going in there the welfare queen that that image was like indelible i mean it was it was stuck you know, you know, the politicians were really ringing the bell about how Black women were, were just over-reliant on, on the government and how we just, you know, all we do is just sit around and have babies and, you know, we're, we're paid um, welfare um, bucks. And so, so to, to, so that's a lie, you know, right? That's a, that's a lie that, you know, we are, we are reliant, over-reliant on the government. That's a lie. And so to have that lie just kind of perpetuated and, and you know, and to have these seeds and, and tropes in children's media, it's like, it's just very um, disheartening. So I was pleasantly surprised. There might be, you know, there's some improvement is, is the point, is there's, there is some improvement. We've, um, let's turn to um, little Bill. And I, and I said this to you um, um, before, I, before we started. I really hadn't seen Big, um, Little Bill before before reading your article. I mean, I remember seeing the advertisements about it, but it just I was kind of outside of the the age range. I am older than you, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so but I so I didn't watch it. After I read your article, um, my daughter and I we sat down. We went to YouTube, so all of the shows are on YouTube, and um, and we we watched. We watched. Uh, I think. Uh, three episodes in a row. And what I remarked was how slow it was. It Mm -hmm. unfolds in real time, scene by scene. It allows the, the, the watcher, the consumer to understand what's happening absolutely in real time. The, the brain doesn't have to do any mental gymnastics. It doesn't have to jump. It doesn't have to, you know, do any, um, like, like warp speed processing, mm-hmm. it, can, it can allow the brain to really slowly take in things. And um, that I felt was very refreshing and it was real. Little Bill has really big feelings. Mm-hmm. He has reactions the way toddlers have reactions to things. Um, And it allowed Amara, that's my daughter's name, to really soak in and process the the way that a toddler should be able to do with children's content. So the one scene that I I was talking about was um, little Bill got really upset because his he, he had worked so hard in his artwork and he was really proud of it. And it was going to be hung up by the teacher on the on you know on display. And one of his friends um spilled some water on it and it just ruined it and in retaliation little bill like um balls up or or rips um or does something to destroy um her artwork and it became a thing like the teachers had to talk to him that the the parents had to talk to him his brother had to talk to him and the whole time until the end of the show he's like 
but I'm upset. Yeah. I'm angry. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, and his anger and being upset though, wasn't demonized. Mm-hmm. And right. that's, and that's the kind of, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah, a yeah. little black boy can misbehave, but yet he was not demonized. Mm-hmm. And that is what happens over and over and over in mainstream content. The the black boys are seen as these problem kids. And when they misbehave, it is only an afterthought that we that some layer is peeled back and it, we figure out why. There's some underlying reason. He's and it's always sad and in pain and, you know, it's some broken home and, you know, which is always, you know, in, in, for, so yes, there is some truth to that, mm-hmm. but it is not all true. Right. You know, right. not all black, you know, black children come from broken homes. And, yeah. and what is the reason why those homes are broken? We can, that's a whole nother reason. <laughs> it's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> but yes, give me your, um, some of your reaction to yeah, I mean, totally though. I mean, even what, with what you're just saying, it is interesting how, you know, it would have to take a broken home or a really intense home situation in order to make anger a valid emotion mm-hmm. for a black boy. You know, it couldn't just be he's a human being who has a, a spectrum of emotions like all human beings do. And so, yeah, like with that episode, the fact that little Bill can just be angry and not have someone try to hush him or reprimand him or just try to silence it in any way. I mean, especially for then, it, I mean, I mean, I wasn't thinking about it at the time watching it, but it is pretty rare, you know, to see in shows like these. And yeah, I mean, little Bill too, just in general in that series, you know, he was never, like he was a very happy-go-lucky little boy. Mm-hmm. You know, he liked going grocery shopping. <laughs> you know, he just liked being in the neighborhood, like simple things. Mm-hmm. You know, he wasn't, his character wasn't defined by his home situation not being ideal or struggling at school or, you know, you know, not wanting to be at home and wanting to be out with his friends instead, you know, like these tropes of what defines a black boy's character like he's just living his life and I think maybe that too was something that drew me or drew me in particular to that show back then because he was just being little Bill you know and even just his nickname little Bill the fact that you know he can be little and cute and some like endearing you know that's a wonderful thing and not something that's really really common for black boys to get to be endearing, you know, in a wider um, perception sense. Right. So, yeah, no, yeah, totally. Well, we definitely need to go back to that, and you know, and and you know, we will, we will, um, you know, the director aside. Um, I mean, I, I guess I, I will just say it is just too bad. It is. It is certainly yeah. a shame. Um, yeah, it's a shame because there there were. A lot of writers, a lot of directors, creators, um, and producers behind the scene, other than him. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, so kudos to to all the team. Uh, you know, they did a great thing. And yeah. so I I implore the creators out there to to do it again, to to be able to take children, um, to take their innocence to take their their evolution of thought and their maturity and their growth and show it Mm -hmm. and to show all of it in in the sweet and kind way that that um that they are so um I could talk to you forever yeah (laughs) Uh, I really but you know I I really really just appreciate it um Kadogo is uh trying to take all of the good content trying to curate it um, aggregate it onto kadobo.tv. Um, I'm, you know, as a new entrepreneur, this is a, it has to be more than a passion project. I mean, this is, this is something that I think that, you know, needs to be, um, 
uh, grown. And uh, the, my latest thought is that not only do we need to just you know, put all the good stuff into one place, but we also need to have economic drivers that will help support. So, um, you know, what I understand of children's content is that the the economic drivers are the, those commercials. So we have we have, you know, corporations who buy their spots, and they want, you know, maximum dollar as as you know as capitalist society as we are. We everyone wants maximum dollars. So, so writers and directors and um, show heads, they will do what works. And so they'll do what works because it worked the last time. Well, what worked the last time were stereotypes. And what works the last time is some sort of formula. All these shows all have a formula. And so if the silly sidekick is the formula that worked the last time, they're gonna do the silly sidekick again. And so what I'm trying to, to, to do here is to create um, better economic drivers. So find the corporations who are mission aligned, find the black and owned companies who are also kid centric and have them to um, place their own very carefully made um, ads, not misleading, you know, things that are, that are more for the parents because they're going to be co-watching um, with their little kids. And make sure that um, that the the that there is an ecosystem that really supports the kind of creators that we want to see. Right. And so uh, uh, the also the other thing that I would like to do is to um, improve and to increase the creator pipeline. So creating kids content, it's not easy. You know, it takes like psychologists, it takes researchers, it takes great writers, it takes the people who understand childhood development. And we need to interlace that with people who understand the cultures, black cultures, mm -hmm. and understand how to weave all of that in together so that it's not weighty and, <laughs> and weird, but that it actually is um, age appropriate. So all of that, it also takes support. And, and you know, we can't just, we can't, live in our separate islands and do all of this these things you know, together um, separately. We've got to be able to come together in a community. So um, you're now in the creator community <laughs> because you're you know just you have a great brain, you have a great mind and you express yourself wonderfully. And so I'm gonna be calling you all on you again. I don't know, you know we'll, yeah. oh I have to say I had this wonderful conversation with a woman and she would like to do what you did with mm. AI. She's like this AI expert. Yeah. And so she wants to build like this algorithm, or at least we talked about building this algorithm so that we um, scenes can be analyzed with, you know, oh. who has what line, what are the interactions, you know, and so that then we can use that as data, 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 data. Nice. I That'd love that. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I oh think my gosh. That's brilliant. Yeah. Love that. All right. I'll, I'll definitely call you to, when we get to the point where we're actually talking about these scenes. You can Great. help us like. That would be fantastic. That's so exciting. Yes. Yes. She's very excited too. We, we came, we came to this conversation very organically. Um, we were at the, the Black Economic Council um, of Massachusetts and we just started, we were introduced and we just, we kept on talking and talking and talking. And this is one of the things that came up. AI coding. That is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait for that. That's, I, I'm just so excited for that. Right? Yeah. All right. Okay. We'll end on that message. <laughs> end on the high note. You have a good rest of your day. All right. And, Thank you. You, you know, too. It's it always, a, it's, it's, it was a great pleasure to talk to you. Yeah. Likewise. I enjoy chatting. Awesome. All right.